Let's change the subject. Let's take an entirely different subject, which I find fascinating. These guys are the Brothers Grimm. And they gave you Cinderella, and they gave you Snow White. It is not generally known how much else they gave you, because in fact, what was their day job? They were linguists in German universities. And they came up with Grimm's Law, which was that they noted how the vowel, pardon me, how consonants had shifted over, through Europe over various times. And this was the beginning of something else we'll be talking about. I heard a very amusing anecdote, probably not true, but I'll pass it on. Because there are two forms of work, the fairy tales and the linguistic work, are treated as unrelated. But the story I heard was as follows. What they were trying to do was map the different forms of pronunciation on a map of Germany and how they had changed. And of course, by now it was 1780, 1800, and the fast-moving modern world was, moving, was swirling people around. So how would they find the people who had lived longest in a given spot? Well, they would go to the local storekeeper or tavern and say, we were looking for old stories. And who would have the old stories? Why, the old people who had grown up in that place. And so, two birds with one stone, the linguists found them in the business of storytelling. I don't know if it's true, isn't it? No. <laughs> so, the next thing that came along, in theory, about that same time, Sir William Jones, a British administrator in India, postulated an Indian origin for European languages. And in 1814, someone named Rasmus Christian Rask wrote an essay on the postulated, the structured details of the postulated Proto-Indo-European language. And now that is why they accept that most of the European languages, the ones we call Indo-European, the Greek, the Slavonic, the Germanic, the, including English, the, uh, uh, the, the Celtic, all came from a common root, Proto-Indo-European. Except for certain languages. There's the Basques, I won't talk about them, I haven't researched them. And there are the Finns and the Laps, who prefer to be called the Sami, and the Hungarians. Okay, that family, Finns, Laps, Hungarians, we'll come back to them. But what was really happening? And essentially, I'm putting this together from various things I've read, and I haven't read this in one place. What was really happening? How did the Indo-European language reach Europe? Okay, what was really happening was what I would call the Big Melt, because 8 to 10,000 BC, the ice above London was 2,000 feet thick, and uh, similarly over Europe, whereas the English Channel was a valley in which mastodons roamed. They keep bringing up the teeth from the English Channel among the flounders. And in any case, the big melt was when the ice went down and the sea level rose. And this had drastic effects for the movement of human beings. And it is almost certain, I think, that it was at that time which coincidentally is called the end of the Mesolithic Age and the beginning of the Neolithic Age. Lithic, of course, means between stones, okay? Stone, axes, stones, and that. <clears throat> so, Mesolithic was the Middle Lithic age, uh, period. Neolithic was the New Stone Age. In the Mesolithic period, they had little tiny knives, little tiny tools. 
And in the Neolithic, they didn't have to be so small. What happened? Answer, the ice melted, and we came out of India, as far as I can tell. And the dispersion, then, into the different language groups took place 10,000 years ago. But wait, and this is the interesting part. This is my hypothesis. There was one group who was already here because they had conquered the snow. This is the best I could find. The people we call Laps, that like to be called Sami, they had reindeer, and skis, and sleds. So they had mastery of a land that was closed to everyone else. And my guess is that they were there before the big melt. They were all over Europe. Because why? We know what their language group is where it is now, but the larger language group, which apparently is related to, goes as far as Mongolian and Turkish. This, these thoughts were inspired when I read somewhere long ago, I couldn't find it now, undoubtedly my note, that a small statue of a reindeer had been found in Turkey that was five, ten thousand years old. And what kind of language do they speak in Turkey? Well, <clears throat> get back to that. Let's look first at the Finno Ugric family. Now, here, <clears throat> these are the spots, <clears throat> the principal ones, where they speak Finno Ugric, i.e., those languages known to be derived from the common root. That is that of the, of the Sami, and now Finland and Estonia. <clears throat> so we see Finland, and above there, that blue and white striped patch is a notional country that they like to call Sapmi, S-A-P-M-I. That is their name for it, the Sami people. But in fact, since it's partly in northern Norway, partly in northern Sweden, partly in northern Finland, and partly in northern, northwestern Russia, it will never actually be a country. But that is where they retreated to. That is where the reindeer culture remained when the rest of the place had dried up. But we see the pockets. Look, Hungary. The finno ugric language. And other pockets of other finno ugric languages all over. So, the hypothesis the hypothesis I'm proposing to you is that the Lapish people, or Sami, ruled the snow and ice more than 10,000 years ago, before the Great Melt, when you and I, or our genes, walked out of India, probably through the Khyber Pass. <clears throat> 